stay with us. I also want to bring in CNN political commentator Bakari Sellers, who himself is a lawyer, along with Natalie Jackson, a former co-counsel for the families of Trayvon Martin, Breonna Taylor, and others. Also with us, Cheryl Dorsey, a retired LAPD sergeant, author of the book Black and Blue. Uh, sergeant Dorsey, the Minneapolis police chief, testified very bluntly that Chauvin's actions were in no way... Uh, shape or form, his words, part of their policy or training and, and certainly not part of what he described as our ethics or values. How powerful do you believe that testimony was? Today was the case for the murder, too. What we saw today was the policy and procedures being reviewed. We also heard from the police talking about causation. And I would just say today was the, it really was an outlying of the case for murder, too, in this case. Well, uh, 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 Sar Sergeant Dorsey, what do you think? Well, I think uh, it's going to be very difficult to argue against a sergeant a lieutenant, a commander, and ultimately the police chief. They're clear on their policies and procedures, and none of what we saw was taught. And so what the defense is going to ultimately try to do is speak to what was in Chauvin's mind, because understand, it's very difficult to argue what's in someone's head. Let me go back to Omar for a second uh, before I go to Bakari. O Omar, how does the community there in Minneapolis view Chief uh, Arredondo? How much weight? Does his testimony carry? He's been the police chief there, what, for three years? It carries a lot of weight because a lot of what people are looking for is sort of that traditional blue wall of silence that you might see in departments or what you've seen in police historically, that police won't testify against police, they won't rat out police officers. And what you're seeing now is, at the very least, a symbolic move of the current police chief saying that what Derek Chauvin did is not representative of who we are as Minneapolis police officers. So that rings true in the community. And on top of that, he has stayed consistent over this. You remember, he fired Chauvin and these officers within 48 hours of this happening back in May. And weeks later in June, he released that letter to the community saying, we believe what Derek Chauvin did was murder and make no mistakes about it. It does not fall within our ethics and values as Minneapolis police officers. And you heard some of that play out over the course of court today. No doubt hoping to make an impact on many in the community who are watching. You know, Bakari, we also heard very blunt testimony from the former commander of the police training division there in Minneapolis, the inspector Katie Blackwell. Uh, someone who's known Derek Chauvin for some 20 years, and she said Chauvin's knee on Floyd's neck is not what we train. Her direct words, not what we train. How far do you think that might go with the jurors? So I think today was the strongest day for the prosecution that we've seen. I mean, last week was very emotional. You had a lot of uh, young people testify. You had our heartstrings being pulled. But today really went to the heart. And I don't see how... Uh, you get around, if you're a defense attorney like I am, how you get around a, ju a guilty verdict on something. I mean, what we saw today was he was completely reckless, negligent, and the question will be whether or not he was intentional or not in his acts. Because it, it's also rare, Wolf, and I want people to understand this. I mean, I'm sitting with, with some women who've actually done this before in, in particular, but it's very rare to see uh, law enforcement come in a courtroom one after one after one and and actually testify against another law enforcement officer. I mean, today was a brilliant day and a very good day for this country because what we saw was law enforcement quite clearly coming out and saying, what this gentleman did was wrong. These are our policies extremely clearly, and this is how he violated these policies. And so what we saw today is something that we don't see often in cases like this, and I think that's going to be the, 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 dif the difference between a guilty and not guilty verdict. We still have a long way to go in uh, and I'm, I'm sure the criminal defense attorney is going to be trying to, to muddy the water a little bit and say that drugs played a role uh, in his death. Um, but today is going to be a very difficult hurdle for them to overcome. And I don't see how you get around a guilty verdict on at least one of those charges when they go back to the jury room. Of those three charges. You know, Natalie, uh, we also heard uh, what I thought was a very significant testimony uh, to the, today from that ER physician who tried to save George Floyd's life uh, once he got to the hospital, this doctor said the most likely explanation for Floyd's death was lack of oxygen. So how crucial is that to the prosecution's argument? I think it's very crucial because we heard the word asphyxiation, lack of oxygen. We heard it again with the um, police chief when they talked about positional asphyxiation. So 
right now, what we've heard is that George Floyd did not die from drugs. George Floyd did not die from an adrenaline rush. George Floyd did not die from um, overexcitement. What he died from was a lack of oxygen. And, it, and this is very important to prove any of the murder one or murder three charges. They have to prove that Shaven kill George Floyd. You know, Bakari, uh, the uh, ER doctor said uh, every minute CPR wasn't administered, George Floyd's chances of surviving went down and down and down. Does that emphasize, emphasize the failure to provide care while Floyd was in Chauvin's custody? No question about it. And again, those jurors have to be feeling uh, that if uh, Derek Chauvin or any of those officers actually allowed for George Floyd to receive some type of treatment, uh, that his chances for survival would have been greater. But you see that lack of compassion, and then you start to get, uh, you, you start to, to get from words like reckless, you start to, to move on from words like negligent, you start to actually get into those words like uh, uh, intentional and willful, um, and, and showing that, that willful disregard for his life. And, and that's what we're seeing. The prosecution today is, is making it extremely clear and have laid out a brilliant case thus far uh, for, for guilt on possibly after today something like all three charges. Well, Sergeant Dorsey, how do you see it? Absolutely. And listen, we heard the defense posed a lot of hypotheticals because that was the best that they could do today. But none of those things that they were asking uh, in terms of, well, what about if there was a shooting and, uh, you know, other uh, scenarios that would make the force reasonable and the duration of the force make sense, none of those things were in play. And so I think it's going to be very difficult to overcome the credibility of the uh, lieutenant, sergeant, commander, and ultimately the chief of police who's clear and firm on what the policy is for his officers. Yeah, he was very, very clear. All right, everybody, uh, thank you very, very much. Just ahead.